ever since I released the Select Fire Rapid Strike Kit, I continued to make improvements and updates to address any issues that arose in manufacturing or assembly, or to improve the overall user experience based on any sort of customer feedback. For example, maybe someone had some trouble routing some wires behind the board because a component was too tall and got in the way. I can replace that component and, or move it around. Another time when a customer plugged in the battery to the kit and a capacitor exploded. I can replace that capacitor to ensure that doesn't happen. When I designed this kit, or really any of my other products, the main goal is always to provide a smooth and simple user experience during installation and usage. I want to empower cool features in your blaster like select fire control and PWM and MOSFET power without requiring you to be an expert in electrical engineering coding. I wanted to abstract away all the complex electronics and coding that makes everything possible. So all you really need to do is solder a few things, plug them in, and you're good to go. But what if something goes wrong? What if your kit doesn't work as expected? I understand that it can be kind of intimidating, especially if you're not an expert. I wanted to provide a way to help debug the kit if anything goes wrong and to help guide you step by step when installing this kit to make sure you're on the right track. That's where these cool little debug LEDs come in. It's these guys at the bottom, on the back side of the PCB. It's been implemented in the Rapid Strike Kits version 1.3 and above. And they, the LEDs themselves turn on and off or change intensity to help show what's going on inside the blaster. Here's a quick little demo. So here's the kit installed in a blaster, but notice how the debug LEDs are on the back and not the front. On the front, it would obviously be you know better since you can see the LEDs while the kit is fully installed, but just placing the components on both the front and back is a bigger issue in terms of manufacturing and assembly. And also, you know, during magazine insertion and stuff, I don't want any component to get knocked off. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in my 2S LiPo. And let's see what happens to the LEDs when they, when they plug in the battery. Notice how a few LEDs turn on first, and then the rest turn on. If nothing lights up, you know you did something wrong. Watch what happens when the blaster fires. The little LEDs turn on and off to show what's happening. Think about in a TV where a little LED flashes to let you know that the TV is turning on. It's the same concept as what's happening here. We also use debug LEDs in engineering projects when I was at Apple, and they helped a ton for the same purpose. There is a debug LED for each input that you're responsible for, and each LED is labeled. There's an LED for power to see that the board is receiving power. There's one for the switches to see if they're being pressed, one for the pusher state on and off, one for the knob so you can see the rate of fire, and one for the fire mode so you can see the uh, rotary switch. Going back to the blaster, notice how, let's watch the trigger LED right now. Notice how when the trigger isn't pressed, the LED is off. But when the trigger is pressed, the LED turns on. And same thing for the psycho control switch as well. Now let's plug in the knob to see what happens, and let's plug it directly into the knob part. Okay, and let's take a look at that blue LED, where it says rate of fire. Notice how the knob, when I turn the knob, the LED turns brighter or dimmer. For the select fire switch, which is right at the top, each fire mode corresponds to a certain brightness. Almost off is safety, one third brightness is semi-auto, Two-third brightness is burst, and full brightness is full auto. Notice how when the LEDs are at their lowest setting, they're still a tiny bit on. This is to let you know that something is still happening, it's just at the lowest intensity. The LEDs for the switches or for the pusher state turn completely on or off because that means the switches aren't being pressed at all or the pusher is fully off, so nothing is really happening. I think it's most helpful to use the debug LEDs as a step-by-step -step guide during assembly. This means you can solder something, plug it in, and check the debug LEDs to see what's happening to make sure you, what you did was correct. I think this is easier because you know every single step of the way, you can see if you're correct or not, as opposed to doing it all at the end where if something went wrong, it's sort of hard to tell 
exactly which step uh, something went wrong in. So first, we start with the power. Wire up your battery connector and solder it to the board. Then, when the battery is plugged in, some LEDs will turn on to let you know that your battery and your battery connector is good. So, let's plug that in and the LEDs turn on. Don't plug the power switch in. If the LEDs don't turn on, double check your battery to make sure everything is good. Make sure your battery is charged and make sure you have the polarity correct on the battery itself and the, all the connectors. You can see there's labeled for polarity on the board itself. After the battery, I'd recommend testing the switches one switch at a time. It doesn't really matter which order you go in. Wire up and plug in the trigger switch. When the trigger switch is pressed, the trigger LED should turn on. You can ignore the other lights for now. When the trigger switch is not pressed, the trigger LED turns off. And repeat the same for the cycle control switch. If the LEDs don't turn on and off, make sure you've soldered the correct pins on the switches and make sure you have good solder joints. For the power switch, if you want to add one, just simply wire it up and plug it in. When the power switch is on, the LED should be on. But when the power switch is off, the LEDs turn off. Now, let's take a look at the knob. Before wiring and plugging the knob, notice how the rate of fire LED is at its max brightness. This is because the kit, by default, without the knob is set to max rate of fire. After wiring up the knob, plug it in. The intensity of the rate of fire LED should turn on and off depending on how much the knob is rotated. If the intensity of the LED isn't changing, make sure the knob is wired correctly. Finally, let's finish up with the rotary switch. Before wiring up and plugging in the rotary switch, notice how the fire mode LED is at its max brightness. This is because the kit, by default, without the rotary switch, is set to max rate of fire. After wiring up the rotary switch, plug it in. If you haven't noticed by now, my rotary switch in this blaster is just on the other side of the shell. The intensity of the fire, mo fire mode LED should change with the rotary switch position. I'm going to block the other LEDs for now, because we're only focusing on this one. The dimmest, almost off, is safety. One third brightness is semi-auto, two thirds brightness is burst, and full brightness is for full auto. If the intensity isn't changing, make sure your rotary switch is wired in and plugged in correctly. Once you've verified that everything is working, like the battery, the switches, the knob, and the rotary switch, plug in the pusher and you're good to go. There are LEDs to show if the pusher is on or off. If the pusher LED is on, but the pusher itself isn't on, Make sure that your pusher is wired correctly and actually works. And that's it. I hope these e-bug LEDs helped. If you run into any more issues, don't hesitate to reach out for help. Also, if you have any more feedback for the kit, let me know. It helps me continue to make this product even better. Thanks for watching.